Um, if you would turn with me this morning over to Acts chapter 6. We're actually going to be looking at Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8. Uh, partially chapter 9. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of summarize some things uh, to you this morning. Uh, through these chapters. And we're going to address some of the, the verses as, as they come up. Um, we're going to be talking about two specific men in the New Testament. and They just happen to be two of my favorite characters in the New Testament. Uh, one of them is very familiar to you and you'll recognize right off the bat. And the other one is probably a little less familiar to you. Um, he's, not, he's only mentioned here in, in Acts chapter 6, 7, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, but his name is Stephen. And uh, this man of God um, is first mentioned here in, in Acts chapter 6. Um, what we find here in chapter 6 is, is the disciples are faced with a, with a great dilemma. I mean, this was after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples. And, and it tells us that they were... Uh, that the Holy Spirit fell upon them as tongues of fire. And they all spoke in different tongues, and tongues that the people that were in the crowds could understand. They were speaking in their language. And this day of Pentecost was part of the, 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 the Feast of Pentecost, and one of the seven feasts of Israel. And this was a celebration of remembrance of, of whenever God had, had called Moses up to Mount Sinai and gave him the the Ten Commandments. and So this was a celebration or remembrance of, of that day and that time. So this was, a, this was a great feast. This was something that was traditional that they did. So they would come from all, all around to be a part of this feast in Jerusalem. So there was many people from different regions. Uh, there was people from different nationalities. If you read Acts chapter 2, they had all gathered to this one place and Whenever the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples and they were speaking in tongues that they could recognize and understand, these people were drawn to this, this event and what was happening. And we know that there was a great, what we would call a revival at this time. And over 3,000 received the Lord during this movement of God. So during this time in Jerusalem, there was a number of believers amongst who had been all of a sudden just placed under the disciples' leadership, direction, guidance, and counsel. I mean, overnight, the disciples were, had built a mega church. So this was a huge burden, a huge responsibility. And here in Acts chapter 6, we see that a group of these people came to the disciples and they were complaining because their widows weren't being treated like the other widows were. There was some great tension and what we would probably even label as racial division with amongst the groups. And the disciples' response to this was they gathered together and they, they decided that it was more important for them to focus on the Word of God on the preaching and the teaching of it. And that they did not have time to tend to tables. So what they did in order to address this issue and, and to solve this problem is they tell the people to look out amongst yourselves and pick out men who are of great reputation and full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And the congregants did this. And they, one of the men that they chose was Stephen. But Stephen didn't have much, even much opportunity to step into this new role that he had received. And in, in, in chapter 6, we see that Stephen says in verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. But it says in verse 9, Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the free men, so Syrians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And it says, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly introduced, induced him, induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. 
And it says, And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel. I want to address this for a moment. Stephen was chosen for this great task, this great responsibility, and immediately he was accused of blasphemy and brought to the council and immediately put on trial. But it says that when they saw this man, when they looked at him, that his face shone like an angel. And we learned in, in just a second ago over in Acts chapter 6 that one of the requirements for those that they looked out and, and called to take on this duty, this responsibility, is that they were men filled with what? The Holy Spirit and wisdom. See, God was on Stephen's side. Amen. Amen. But he was brought forth before the council and and Stephen addresses the council in his, in his defense, and he takes them through this long speech, and he takes them back to the ancestry and, and their, their heritage. And he starts with Abraham and Isaac and then Jacob and Joseph and all the way through David and Solomon. But then he comes to a place in his speech where he says something that is just so bold that had to have taken such courage for him to speak. And if you turn with me uh, to Acts chapter 7, verses 51 through 53. Stephen ends his speech with this. He says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Man, how bold of a statement to make to the ones who are holding your life in their hands. How bold of a statement. I mean, he had to have known that by saying these words that surely, surely they could take his life. But Stephen didn't hold back from Amen. speaking the truth and sharing the truth in spite of the consequences. No matter what it hit, the cost was, Stephen was true to what he felt was true and what he believed. He was true to his faith, no matter what the consequences were. Amen. And it says in verse 54, it says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But then we read here in verse 55, it says, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. See, Stephen, at the point of knowing that, hey, this isn't going well, looked up into the heavens and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And you know, Something that stood out to me in this passage of Scripture that I never paid attention to before, never noticed, was the fact that Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 9, it tells us that Jesus ascended into heaven and He sits at the right hand of God. Right. Sits at the right hand of God. But yet in this case, in this, in this moment, on, in, in this case of Stephen, and Stephen looks up and he sees him standing at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. What does that mean? I don't know exactly. I can, I can assume some things. Maybe it was, maybe it was Jesus' way of showing Stephen that, listen, Stephen, no matter what happens here, it's going to be okay. Maybe it was Jesus' way of saying, Stephen, listen, let's not... They may take your life, but remember, I have come to prepare a place for you. The Word of God tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Maybe this was Jesus' way of assure, giving Stephen assurance that, Stephen, listen, no matter what this costs you in this life, 
the life you have after this one is, is far greater and far better than anything that you can imagine. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Amen. Apostle Paul recognized that, listen, in this life we have a duty, we have a responsibility, and you know God has set forth things for us to do and accomplish here in this life and this earth. And we should do it with great joy. But to be absent from the body and be present for the Lord, man, that's the ultimate victory. That's the ultimate go go. That is where the glory is. And Stephen was faced with death. But it did not stop him. And I believe that this gave Stephen such confidence, such comfort. And that's why he says with such boldness again, straight to his accusers, he says, look, in verse 56, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. As if to say to his accusers, listen, you may take my life, but listen, you're only going to speed up my, my entrance into the glory of God. And that glorious day when I'm standing face to face in the presence of my Lord and my Savior. He was given such confidence, comfort, and boldness by this vision that God had given him. And I believe that he faced his accusers with great boldness, with great courage, because of the assurance that he had in his salvation and who his Lord was. And it tells us that Stephen cried out to God as they drug him out of the city and they stoned him. He said, O Lord, receive my spirit. And it says he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I love that they put that in there, that he fell asleep. Because, listen, he would be raised again, and he would be in the presence with the Lord. His spirit would go directly to be with the Lord. That's scriptural. And that's the story of Stephen. The main reason I wanted to tell you the story of Stephen was get to this next person, this next individual. And this individual is, was known at this time as Saul. And it tells us in, verse, in chapter 8 of verse 1, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Now listen, this term consenting means that, listen, Paul, or Saul, he, he, he gave his okay for what happened to Stephen. Okay? And it tells us that then there was a great persecu persecution that spread across the church. And it says in verse 2, and, de and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. This was a man that was bent on the destruction in the, of, of the church, bent on stopping this great movement of God, this movement called Christianity. His purpose was to stop what was happening. But you know what? <laughs> Something that really stood out to me was in was verse 4. Is right after... It says that Saul had made havoc on the church and entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. In verse 4 it says, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Hallelujah. Amen. And that's just a reminder to us that, listen church, what, what the enemy desires for our harm, God can turn it around for our good. Amen. And listen, there is no stopping what God is doing. It's His plan. That's right. It's his purpose. His plan was to build the church. His plan is to build the church today. Yes. And there's nothing that's going to stand against the church because right. we are the bride of Christ. Amen. And we are being prepared for our, for our husband. We are being prepared for him. And God's not going to let anything happen to that. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, we are seeing the church persecuted in ways that maybe we haven't before. In this day, in this time. And I listen, I don't I say this lightly with the church in America being persecuted. When I look at the church over in the Middle East, how they're being persecuted, it's nothing compared to what we're facing. That's right. But in ways we are being persecuted here in the United States as believers. Our rights are being taken from us and Amen. 
they're trying to dictate what we can or what we can't say about our faith. And mentioning that name above all names, Jesus. That, that name that is offensive to those that are outside the faith. We are being limited in what we can and cannot say. But I think we need to take an example from Stephen. Yes. That we stand bold and confident and not wavering in our faith. And that we do not keep silent in times of persecution. I mean, we've been given a great message. And though the church here was being persecuted and scattered, listen, they took the word with them. And wherever they went, they preached the word. Paul tells Timothy, be ready, Timothy, in season and out of season. We need to be ready in season and out of season. Amen. Amen. But we see this contrast of these two men. This man that was so faithful even to the point of death. And then we see this man who was so bent on destroying the church and stopping this great movement of Christianity. But you know who Saul is. We know that Saul had an experience with, with God. And during his persecution of the church, as he was traveling from place to place and bringing Christians and <laughs> placing them in prison, we see a, a trip that Paul was on, Saul was on, and he was on his way to Damascus. And, and on this road to Damascus, we see that Jesus meets him there. And Jesus cries out to Saul. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And, you know, I'm not sure why he addressed him as Lord. I mean, this is the same, the same one he was trying to persecute and stop this great movement from. Trying to discredit the name of Jesus. But yet, man, he came face to face with him. All of a sudden, he's Lord. Isn't that how it is? When we get a revelation of who Jesus is, listen, He's Lord. He is Lord. And then Jesus tells him, He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I know I've shared this before, but what goads were, were they, would, they were these long pointed rods that herdsmen would use in herding an oxen in biblical times. And these rods were used to prod the oxen. Whenever the oxen would get off, tr off the trail or get off track or try to go a different direction than what the herdsman was leading it, the rods were used to prod them and get them back on, on track, to get them back straight. And I believe what Jesus was telling Paul during this time was, listen, Paul, you're finding it hard to resist the work that I've been doing in your life. You've been resisting and you've been fighting it You've been fighting the goads. But now's the day, Saul. This is the day yes. when you're going to know who I am. I'm going to make myself known to you. Mm -hmm. And no longer will you be persecuting my church, but you will be a key influence in the building of my church. Hallelujah. And this is a reminder to us, church, that listen, that God can take the hardest of individuals the worst of sinners, and use them in a mighty way. And we see that in 1 Timothy. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 1, you'll turn there with me, starting with verse 12. It says, And I thank Christ, this is Paul speaking to Timothy. He says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on Him for everlasting life. Is there anybody that's too far from redemption? I don't believe so. I don't think there's anybody that's too far out of the reach of hand of grace and mercy given to us by God. Paul wasn't. And Paul was the worst of sinners. 
I mean, he was bent on destroying this movement of Christianity. He had said his life purpose was to stop this movement. And yet he can say with such confidence here that, listen, Timothy, this is a, a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. But for one person that said Jesus can't save is now saying that He's the only way of salvation. And then he says, I am chief of sinners. And he says, but for however, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all on suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on Him for everlasting life. It was Paul that says in Ephesians that for by grace you have been saved, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That was, those were Paul's words. Paul's words. You tell me, should, is, is there anyone that, that knows the grace of God any better than what Paul did? This man who was a blasphemer? This one who, who consented to the death of Stephen, this faithful man of God? Is there, is there anyone that had any better example that we have than Paul of God's grace and his mercy and his forgiveness? Anybody knew about God's grace, it was Paul. It was Paul. And Paul's saying, listen, I know the truth. And he says here in chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then we read also in 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. God took this man who was so hardened against the church and against Jesus and used him in such a big way. We know that most of the New Testament is written by Paul. We know that he is the one who was called to bring this gospel message to the Gentiles. And he was used in a, in a mighty way. We've seen such an example through Stephen of what it is to be bold, to be confident in our faith, and to stand fast, and to not be shaken or wavered in, in our belief. And then we see such an example of a man who was so bent on destroying the church, but yet God came into his life and met him on the road to Damascus and, and changed his life forever. I mean, what examples... That is to us of, of what it is to be a faithful follower of Christ and that, listen, none of us are deserving of what we've been given. Paul didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. Did Paul deserve grace and mercy? No. Not in our eyes. But in God's eyes, he saw something in Paul that Paul didn't, that we can't see in Paul. And it's the same with us. God sees something in us that Nobody else sees. And God can use us for His glory no matter what our past is. No matter where we've been and what we've done. God can wipe all that clean and give us a clean slate to start with. And listen, once we've been given that gift of grace and mercy, we're a new creation in Christ. Paul was a new man. He was no longer Saul, but he was Paul. A new creation in Christ. And you and I, as believers in Jesus, we too are a new creation in Christ. That means that the old passes away, the old man dies, and we become this new creation in Christ. Paul didn't go back to his own old habits, his old ways. He was a changed man, never to be the same again. When we are truly converted, when we place our faith and our trust in Jesus and Him alone, so we're a new creation in Him. And no longer can we be the same, because we're different. We have God's Spirit living within us. The Word God tells us that when we receive Christ, we receive His Spirit. We are sealed by His Spirit. And we have His Spirit living within us. And His Spirit gives us the power to live our lives in obedience to Christ Amen. and His commands. Paul was obedient even to the point of death. We don't read about his, his, his murder, but we know through history that Paul was, was, was suffered death by the hands, possibly by 
Nero himself in the Roman Empire. But he was obedient to death. Just like, listen, just like the rest of the disciples, other than John, gave his life for the church, for the faith, for the call. And you and I need to have such faith that we're willing to sacrifice it all for the truth of the gospel. Amen? Amen. To not waver in it, but to stand fast and strong and to not give in to the perfect to the things that we face in this life, anything that comes against us. Because we have the truth that can save the lost. And Paul took this responsibility seriously. I mean, he had been forgiven much. And from who, who much is given, much is required. And Paul took that seriously. And we too ought to take our faith and Seriously, and what we have been given. It's a great gift. And it's not to be taken lightly. Amen? Amen. And it's a gift that is free to all who will accept it and receive it. God has no respect to our persons. And that gift is available to all. And we are, listen, we're the hands of people. We're the messengers. Okay? Paul says, how will they hear if there is not a preacher who is sent? Listen, that's us. That's the body of Christ. We've been entrusted with that message. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Please stand. <laughs> so I just want to say a prayer over you this morning. This is a time of invitation. Uh, if you need prayer, um, please come forward. If you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus as Lord in, of your life, and you feel like God is calling you this morning, I want to give you the opportunity to do so. But I want to say a prayer over you this morning. And I also want to give you a time to make those decisions in your life. Heavenly Father, God, I just want to pray over everyone here this morning, Lord. I pray for your perfect will in their lives, Lord. God, I pray that your spirit, Lord, would speak to their hearts, Lord, and draw them closer to you in true, genuine fellowship and relationship with Jesus. God, if, they, if there's someone here this morning and they do not know you as Lord, then I pray, God, that they would make that choice and that decision to lay down their lives before you, accept that gift of grace, accept that gift of mercy, that you provide for your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. It's by faith that we are saved, Lord, not by works. God, we can't earn the gift that you've given us, Lord. It's a, it's a, it's a gift that is given freely, solely because of your love for your people, Lord. And God, I pray that, Lord, that you would just draw those to you, Father, where it tells us that no man comes to you unless they are drawn by you, Father. So, Father, I just pray, God, that you would draw people unto you, Lord. And, God, I pray if there's anyone here that is living with an unrest in their lives, Lord. God, if they can't find peace in their lives, then I pray, God, that they would come to the Prince of Peace this morning. Lord, that they would lay down their burdens on him, Lord, and take up his yoke, Father. And if they do so, your word tells us, Jesus says, I will give you rest. Father, I pray for peace and rest and and everyone here today. And God, I pray that, Lord, that you would just continue to lead us in our lives, Lord, direct us, my Father. For those that are your followers, Lord, help us to, God, to immediately follow after you in all things, Lord. And God, help us to lay down our fleshly desires, Lord, and just truly surrender our hearts and our wills and our lives to you, Lord. Every day. It's a daily decision, Father. God, I just thank you for who you are. God, I praise you for the work that you're doing. God, we look forward with anticipation, God, to the work that you are continuing to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.